Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jan Cleveland and I teach in the Department of English at Carleton and I would like to start this evening by recognizing that Carleton University exists on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. I want to acknowledge that Carleton and all of us who work and reside on this land have a responsibility to the Algonquin people as the first caretakers of Turtle Island. Welcome to the 36th annual Monroe Beattie Lecture hosted by the Department of English. Well, technically this is the 35th such event given that we had to postpone last year's lecture owing to the ongoing pandemic and our first lockdown. This event was begun to recognize the contribution of literary critics and creative writers in Canada. There are a couple of firsts that we acknowledge tonight that the department's founder, Alexander Monroe Beattie, for whom the series is named, would not have envisioned. One is delivering such a lecture to an audience online, fully remote. This is the first time in our history since 1985 that we have not physically gathered together. I want to thank the staff of the Office of the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences for making this live streaming possible. The support of the Dean Pauline Rankin and especially staff members, Emma Fraser, Nick Ward and Ainsley Coghill deserve our thanks. I also want to thank Maria Dabusi, one of our English department administrators for all her help with promoting this event. And I especially want to thank my colleague, Sarah Jamieson for her efforts to bring tonight's guest speaker to this event last year before all of our lives changed so, so very dramatically. In the past, we would have gathered together, listened to an engaging talk, and then had a chance to mingle and buy copies of the author's work and talk to the author. Although we are not physically together tonight, I am assured by our local bookseller, Perfect Books, that they can still provide copies of those works. And you can find them online like everybody else these days. The other first that we're experiencing this evening is that this lecture features the work of a graphic novelist, the celebrated Canadian comic creator, Seth. Seth's books include It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, an autobiographical narrative about a collector's obsessive search for a forgotten cartoonist of the past and the great Northern Brotherhood of Canadian cartoonists, a fictionalized account of a Canadian society in which comics creators are respected and revered. I think we might be starting to move towards that tonight. His most recent book, Clyde Fans, moves away from the metafictional comic-centered concerns of, of the earlier works and tells the story of two incompatible brothers trying and mostly failing to keep their family business afloat as the fan is quickly replaced by the air conditioner. The Guardian hails this book as a masterpiece that excavates the melancholy at the heart of 20th century capitalism. I think that's a fairly apt description. The title of tonight's talk is Inkwell's End, and I will leave that to our guest author to reveal what that title invokes. After the talk, there will be time for some questions. If you have a question, please post it in the chat and we will pass it along to this year's Monroe Beattie guest lecturer, the award-winning graphic novelist, Seth. Okay. Um, normally when I give these sort of talks, um, I usually break them into short sections. And, um, at the, and uh, this is sort of a, a habit I've fallen into. And at the end of each of these sections, I tend to ring a little bell, which is something I've been doing for a few years. So I'm going to do that uh, right now, and you'll hear a bell ring, and that will be the beginning of the lecture. So here we go. The Creek. I suspect many people have had a place like this in their childhood, a place where they encountered the natural world without the watchful eye of an adult a place that remains unnaturally vivid in the imagination. The creek was within easy walking distance, just beyond a new subdivision on the edge of town, a wild area of little streams in the shadow of the bush. Over a fence and into a grassy field, and in that field, a pond 
simply brimming with life. Dragonflies, painted turtles, water striders, whirligig beetles, and of course, frogs. Frogs in all stages of their lives. Always so startling to see them on the threshold of being that final creature. In the field, the milkweed, the cattail, and wheatgrass, Queen Anne's lace, the skunk cabbage, and in the bush, the trillium. The trillium held a special fascination. Being the provincial flower, we were forbidden to pick it. Schoolyard lore warned that if a trillium was picked, it would bleed red blood. I promised never to touch one. I purchased an old postcard of Strathroy, Ontario, postmarked 1909, the old swimming hole. Was this the same spot? Had we inherited it and its name? Was I just one of a long line of boys who played and swam there? I remember how unpleasant the creek bottom felt with just bare feet. The mud and the reeds and the crayfish skittering between your legs. I remember how it felt to be there when you were in a group and how different it felt to be there alone. When I returned as an adult in the 1990s, the creek was unchanged. It was eerily familiar. However, when last I visited, the bush had grown so thick, I couldn't even get near. Shit. I was 14 years old in February of 1976. This was the month and the year in which I bought my first real comic book. I use the term real because like any kid, I'd had comics before. Random issues of Archie or Casper or Little Dot, even the occasional issue of Superman or The Flash. But these were just part of the texture of the everyday world of childhood. The sort of thing you'd pick up in a barber shop or find in a box at summer camp. I'd never given them a second thought. It wasn't until that day in February of 1976 that I sought one out on purpose. That was the first real comic book for me. Here's how it happened. As a child, more than anything, I loved television. This was nothing special. Show me a child back then who didn't love television. In our house, the TV went on the moment someone awoke and didn't go off again until the last person went to bed. Ours was a very small family, just mother, father, and myself. My parents were much older than I, more like grandparents, really. And though ours was a closed little world of three, it wasn't a happy world. My parents had a bad marriage and didn't much care for each other. That's a gross simplification. But as I have only 45 minutes here, and if I am to talk about comics, I dare not speak too much about mother and father. If I do, there will be no time for anything else. They were enormous figures to me. Everything about them was fascinating. Their lives in the Depression and during World War II, their struggles and privations, their mysterious families, of whom I'd never met a soul, Mothers to Keynesian childhood in England, fathers on Prince Edward Island, more like Steinbeck. Though they spoke little to each other, they talked endlessly to me, spilling out their life stories again and again. And as much as they were interested in endlessly recounting these stories, I was equally interested in endlessly listening to them. <laughs> 
it didn't matter how many times they were repeated. In fact, I'd often ask to hear them again. Both have been dead for years now, but I think of them every day. So yes, as I said, they didn't much care for each other. And that might very well explain why our TV was on dawn till dusk. The TV is a great distractor. It fills a room. Neither of them seemed to care all that much about what was on the television. So for the most part, I was the master of the channels. There I sat, close enough to turn the dial. Paper and pencil in front of me, always drawing, even then. Television was different back then. A great deal of the programming space was filled up with dusty old programs. Creaky black and white comedies or silver screen melodramas going back decades. Anything to fill an hour's time. It seemed that 90% of my viewing was from the dim eras before I was born. And I loved it. Much like a mysterious street in which you never knew what might appear around the next corner, so it was when you turned the channel. Who were these faded actors? When did these shows first appear? Who made them, and where were they made? What did any of it mean? Nothing ever explained. No context given, and nowhere to look anything up. Of course, not everything was mysterious or evocative, much of it was cheap junk. But you took it all in equally, and it formed a kind of pop culture stew in the mind. Sometimes things would rise to the surface of the cooking pot. That's just what happened that year, in the fall of 75. I turned the channel, and there was the old Spider-Man cartoon from the late 60s. Oh, I'd seen it plenty of times before, but now, for some reason... It caught my attention. It interested me. More than interested me. I began watching it every afternoon. And when the day came where I had seen all the episodes several times, I decided, like every greedy consumer, I wanted more. It was then that a thought occurred to me. There were comic books of Spider-Man, weren't there? Yes. I'd seen them in the drugstore before. So right then and there, I put on my coat and my boots and marched down, out the door of our rented flat, out into the cold February air, down Leon Street to Mill Street, then right onto Queen and all the way downtown to the Big V drugstore. Then inside, past the greeting cards and the potted plants, over to the newsstand racks, and there, beside Mad, and the monster magazines was a thick stack of comics. And sure enough, somewhere in that stack was a Spider-Man comic. I can see it as clearly as I know my own face. Marvel Tales number 67. Now I just told a bit of a lie there. Until a few moments ago, I did not remember that all this happened in February. In fact, I remembered this little event as occurring on a warm spring day, maybe even summer. As I was writing this down, on a whim, I did a quick internet search for the publishing history of that Spider-Man comic, and to my surprise, I discovered it hit the stands in February. It wasn't warm, it was cold out. So I added some boots and a coat to my story. I wouldn't even bring this up, except for another thing that surprised me. You see, the way I remembered it, buying that Spider-Man comic sparked an interest for more. And so, sometime later, I came back and I bought another comic. Then later, some more. Over time, I started buying comics regularly, and eventually, each week, I was purchasing every single Marvel comic that they published. Looking back, I figured this process took about a year or more. But according to a website I discovered, 
one which lists every comic book by the week it hit the newsstands. I saw that I bought four comics that first month, 11 the next, and then every single one the month that followed. So it all happened a lot, a lot faster than I thought. I shouldn't act surprised, though. It's very in keeping with my obsessive personality. And I do recall with great clarity just how much of an impact that first Spider-Man comic had on me. You see, in all those years of television viewing, I never once thought that I'd like to be an actor or write a movie or direct a TV show. Yet almost the moment I read that Spider-Man comic, I decided, no, I knew that I would become a comic book artist. There was never even a glance backward. No one has ever written an article about my work without the word nostalgia appearing in the first paragraph if not the very first sentence. This is not something I'm happy about. I have conflicted feelings with the word. My critics often mix up nostalgia with the idea that I think the past is a better place. The definition of nostalgia is, quote, a wistful or sentimental yearning for a former place or time, end quote. This definition puts me off as well, though it is certainly a fair charge against me. Wistful? Check mark. Sentimental? Check mark. Yearning for a former place or time? Check mark. What bothers me here is that I often feel that the reviewers have mistaken my character's backward yearnings for my own. They've misunderstood that their longing for the past is not my endorsement that the past is superior to the present. In my opinion, longing is a pretty complicated business. Most of what we long for was never real in the first place. I'd like to think that my stories have a more complex relationship with time and memory and nostalgia than just wishing that everything was like it was in 1945, which, by the way, I don't wish for. I can't complain about all this, though. This is entirely my own fault. I set myself up for it. I've made it almost impossible for readers not to confuse me with my own work. I mean, look at me. Everything about me is old-fashioned, and it's not some kind of accident. I calculated it that way long ago. Back when I was young, I made it a point to dress like an old man. I worked hard to emulate the look of old cartoon drawing styles. I listened to old music. I watched old movies. I cultivated antique tastes. Over time, this ceased to be an affectation. It just became second nature. In fact, I eventually stopped trying to be an old man because, as it happens, I simply turned into the real thing. Back then, I was embracing an era before I was even born. I wasn't nostalgic about it. I couldn't very well pine for an era that I had never lived in. I never thought of it as nostalgia. I was just looking back, interested in the past. Well, maybe fixated on the past is more like it. Now, of course, that I am older, I do feel genuine nostalgia. But it's for my own era, the time of my own youth. I've caught up with myself now. I often feel nostalgic for those early days when I was first being labeled a nostalgist. It's almost embarrassing, like a snake eating its own tail. Underneath all this artifice, though, 
was something else. It took some time to see it, but eventually I realized that my fixation on those decades before I was born had very little to do with me. It wasn't about my interest in the styles or the music or the design of that time. It was all about my parents, that intense connection I have always felt with them. If you recall, I mentioned that they were more like grandparents than parents, a couple of generations away from me. My looking backward was a continuity with them. It's what they did. It seems funny that I didn't instantly know this, but I didn't. It took time. Today, it's glaringly obvious to me. I turned back my own clock to stay in their world. And it was their world. Somehow, they never seemed part of any modern era. They existed perpetually in the past. I mean, sure, I was their child in the 1960s and the 1970s, and they made the normal efforts to keep up with the times. My mother wore polyester pantsuits, and my father had permed hair and drove a Chevy Nova. But even with all this, they both felt more a part of 1945 than 75. I'm sure it's because they talked so much about the past, all the time, always. It was also, I guess, because so much of our stuff was from the past. We moved around a lot. Almost every year, we packed up stakes. This was father's doing. He was always restless. We had a joke, mother and I, that someone was on his tail. The stuff we lugged from house to house was old and faded, most of it from right after the war. Heavy post-war bedsteads and army blankets and clunky appliances that looked more like battleships than toasters. The furniture itself was undistinguished, beat up from too many moves. Those old sticks of lumber have mostly vanished from my mind, but what has stuck are all the little knickknacks mother had gathered over the years. Almost all of it from before I'd been born. She'd rearrange them for each new home, setting them out in familiar patterns on various side tables and cabinets. I've forgotten the shapes of the rooms we lived in, but I know those little mementos intimately. I could describe every one of them to you in perfect detail. The rope monkey candy dish, the ocean liner ashtray, the flying ace cigarette lighter, the wooden shoe sailing ship that lit up like a lamp. I could go on. A good number of them are sitting in my living room today. But who cares? Why am I talking about ancient old souvenirs? Why do we bother to remember old junk like this? My guess is because the past has disappeared. We have nothing of it to hold on to, except memory, and memory is fleeting. That's why the past is so sad. It's always out of reach. Things, though, they hang around. They are the proof that we were there. They take on meaning. We infuse them with it. If you look through my books, you will see that I very often stop the story stone cold to focus on an object. Not because objects are nostalgic, but because objects contain the very past itself. We infuse them with it and with human emotion. It's a good trick as a writer, and it works. It works because it's true. It's no accident that we humans are endlessly constructing things, collecting things, displaying things, treasuring things. Things aren't just things. 
They are markers, anchors we throw out into the stream of time. In my book, George Sprite, I describe the objects left behind in George's room after he has died. In Clyde Fans, I have a long sequence that talks about all the objects in the mother's room after she is gone as well. There is something very poignant about the objects we leave behind. You know that when you get older, especially when the time comes to sort through your parents' things after they have gone, after they've died. But why are these things so sad? They're just things, after all. They're not alive. We've always been told that things aren't important. Things weigh you down. Things aren't real. The monk, Thomas Merton, once said, quote, Before we can see that created things, especially material, are unreal, we must see clearly first that they are real. For the unreality of material things is only relative to the greater reality of spiritual things. End quote. In other words, if you want to see how unimportant things are, you'd best first see just how important they truly are. Why did I instantly decide to become a cartoonist when I read those Marvel comics? Why didn't I feel the same impulse to make television? I guess the obvious answer is that it is much easier to imagine, as a child, making a comic book than making a TV show. All you need is some paper and a pencil. But that's not entirely the answer. I loved to read, and I certainly cherished the books I read as a child, Charlotte's Web, or The Borrowers, or Harry the Dirty Dog. Yet it never crossed my mind to become a prose writer. It never even crossed my mind to make a picture book. Why? All that needed was paper and a pencil too. No, it was something intrinsically in the comics medium itself that drew me in. Certainly, I had always liked to draw, and that was part of it. But more than that, it was the idea of telling a story with drawings. Not illustrating a story with the pictures sitting to the side, but telling the story using the pictures themselves. Part of the appeal, without doubt, was surely the presumed simplicity of the form. Comics look easy. We've all read the newspaper funnies, some doodles in a box, a balloon over top, one square follows another, and then finishes up with a little joke at the end. What could be simpler? I'm sure I approached it that way when I started drawing my own homemade comic books back then. I remember scribbling them down directly in magic marker, no planning, just panel by panel, filling up the pages. This deceptive simplicity is one of the great strengths of the medium. The way the words and pictures combine on the page just feels right. You don't even have to think about it much. As if it mirrors the very way our brains organize coded information. And certainly, today, I can see that the words and the drawings are the same thing. Just symbols on a page. All of it coded together, placed in proper order, to make up a very unique pictographic language entirely its own. Comics have long been looked down on, considered a lowbrow entertainment form. That's why they were ghettoed as children's junk. But the longer 
I draw comics, the more I see how sophisticated the form truly is. Today I understand that things which look easy are often among the hardest to master. Employing the tiny bag of tricks that compose the cartoon language requires the same care, I imagine, poets use when composing a poem. Comics are delicate little confections, and like baking, you need the correct measurements when assembling them. It's very easy to mix the wrong proportions and spoil the cake. Architects use masses and shapes to define empty space, and cartoonists do something similar. We use graphic design to control time. Everything on the comics page is a frozen experience. Nothing moves. The illusion of time passing in the story occurs only inside your brain. It occurs when your eyes move from one panel to the next. The cartoonist controls this action by choosing the number of panels on the page, the shapes of the panels, how the panels relate to each other, and how the panels are arranged on the very page itself. All rather straightforward. And yet the subtleties of invariation involved can take a lifetime to master. This reminds me, all those teenage years, drawing homemade superhero comic books was both a blessing and a curse. It certainly taught me the rhythms of comic storytelling, and it helped me develop the basic skills I needed to make comics. But when the time came, as an adult, to try and tell my own stories in the comics form, I had to unlearn the language of those superhero comics. It took years. To be honest, I'm still unlearning it. As much as I loved those great superhero cartoonists, especially Jack Kirby, I needed a different language than he'd taught me. You can't write a poem using a language designed only to instruct kickboxing. To unlearn, I looked for new teachers. Where I looked in my 20s was the work of Charles Schultz and Robert Crumb. Seemingly, these two artists sit at opposite extremes, but not really. The essential thing that both artists taught me was how to use the comics language to tell personal stories. Stories infused with real human feeling. Those superhero comic books essentially were exercises in shouting. These two artists knew how to whisper. And the quietness they brought out on the page taught me that comics can be an intimate form, an interior experience. Perhaps comics are the most intimate of all the art mediums. It's probably the only one that exists purely inside your brain. You see, that's where you combine the words and the pictures and bring them to life. This is true of the written word as well but you can read a novel aloud to others, share the experience. You can't read a comic aloud. Oh, you can try. Here in panel one, this guy says this, and then in panel two, this guy walks over there and says that. You can even make up little voices for the different figures, but it never works. Comics are not a shared experience. They are meant to be read alone, with the story coming to life only inside your head. They are purely an inner experience. That's why I think of them being so exceptionally suited to stories about looking back. Memory. Where does memory exist? Only in the brain. An entirely inner experience. There was an old Canadian artist, Thoreau MacDonald. He drew little black and white pen and ink sketches in India ink of the Ontario landscape. He never drew from photos or even on site. He would walk around and then go home and draw them from memory. 
He felt it was impossible to recreate the real world in pen and ink, and so he considered these drawings were memory drawings. Symbols on a page to stimulate memory in the viewer. The viewer would create the scene in their own brain, based on his sketch, but bringing it to life with their own memory experiences. This is how I think the drawings in comics work. Sure, it's a drawing of a house, but it's really just a symbol of a house. The artist draws the symbol, but the reader finishes the equation. To me, memory is at the very heart of the comics language. I build my comics worlds on the page in the same way I remember things. I start at the center. When I remember back, say to childhood, there is a process in how the memory surfaces. I place myself somewhere, say the living room of that flat where I first decided to buy that Spider-Man comic. I'm in the center of the memory and then I feel out around me. What is in that room? What furniture? Where is it? Where is the window? What kind of light is there? What is beyond the room? and what is beyond the building. Memory builds upon memory. I don't think of memory as being a film showing inside my head. No, it's more a series of snapshots, but not snapshots of images, snapshots of sensations, moments in time. You feel them first, and then you pull out the snapshots to assemble the images. This arcane system is at the heart of what my comics are all about. A series of carefully constructed picture albums, mostly about memory and almost entirely geared towards stimulating some kind of remembered sensation in the brain or the heart of the reader. If you've read my books, then you might have noticed that there's always a moment where my characters undergo some sort of mystical experience. Like when Owen Moore sees the unifying light underneath everyday reality, or when George Sprott has the white dream of doors closing behind him, or the long sequence where Simon Matchcard has his vision of frozen time. Even my rather silly character, Wimbledon Green, experiences a kind of mystic understanding while wandering the country as a youthful collector. I suppose this might just be the usual moment of epiphany that we are taught to include in every story in Creative Writing 101. Seen that way, it is a very tired device indeed. Of course, it goes without saying I never thought of it that way. Tell the truth, I never thought of it at all. It just seems that every time I write a story, I end up having some scene or moment where the main character tries to get at the unreality of this reality we live our lives inside. Come to think of it, maybe that's why an epiphany is such a cliché because it's so central to our experience, a feeling of unreality about all this. The words, all this, being set in all caps, of course. I don't know about other writers, but I certainly didn't set out to dedicate myself to any specific genre or story. I wasn't too sure back then in my 20s what I even wanted to write about at that age. Coming from the world of comics, I had always thought more about the drawing than the writing. As a child and a teen, when I sat down to draw a comic book, I was simply regurgitating the comics I was currently reading. All I wanted to do was make more of the kind of thing I already liked. So those early homemade comic books are very embarrassing for me to look at today. <laughs> <laughs> 
I still have several piles of them around, and I blush to even glance over them. They are pure, naked wish fulfillment. Sexual repression and teenage testosterone in every panel. The boy version of myself who drew them was completely oblivious to these truths. Well, maybe I wasn't completely oblivious. I knew something was embarrassing about them. I mean, I never showed them to a living soul, so I must have known to keep them to myself. I was ashamed, that I remember. Ashamed of drawing comics and ashamed of loving comics so much. I knew comic books were for people with poor taste, and I knew I so deeply adored them that there must be something seriously lacking in me. All through high school, I kept that interest a dark secret, and when I graduated, I applied to the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. I knew nothing about art, and I certainly had no desire to be a fine artist, if I even knew what a fine artist was. But I did know that I wasn't ready to go out and make comics for real yet. I simply wasn't good enough. Art school seemed a logical place to tread some water and figure things out. I tell this story all the time about arriving in Toronto on that very first visit. I was there for a portfolio review at OCA, now called OCAD. I was a small town boy on his first trade ride alone, and I will never forget that moment of arrival. That ascent up from the dim bowels of Union Station, out the doors and through the colonnade onto Front Street. Like a scene in a movie, the huge facade of the Royal York looming up before me, backlit with a brilliant blue sky. I see it now as clear as day. That is, if any of it really happened that way. Memory is so untrustworthy. But let's forget that comment because surely that is how it happened. It's how I remember it. It's certainly how I've told it over and over and over again all these years. Anyhow, that interview went fine. I was lucky. After I showed the reviewer my portfolio, he said, okay, I've seen your high school art class assignments. Now show me your real work. Somehow, I just sensed that this stuff, mortifying as it was, was my real work. And the reviewer, kind soul that he was, seeing all the effort involved in those comics, and probably ignoring the quality of the work itself, accepted me into the school. He recognized that I may not have been sophisticated, but I was certainly dedicated. Forgive me for rambling on like this. This is all just preamble to my own little epiphany. You see, it didn't take long within the first year for me to lose faith in those superhero comics. Now, living in the big city, surrounded by a whole new world, and every day at art school, confronted by new ideas, new forms of expression, the old interest faded. I saw the light, but in a kind of reverse way. Those comics went from rainbow bright to drab gray. It was a depressing epiphany. You see, I'd spent so many years wanting to be a cartoonist, so many years drawing away in my bedroom, just plugging along at that dream. Well, now I had no other plan. I couldn't imagine any other kind of life for myself. It was a real problem. What in heaven's name would my comics be about now? I'd never really thought about the writing in a comic. You just made that part up without thinking. After losing interest in those four-color fantasies, I was left adrift. And it was a long time before I found my way again. But that part of the story is very boring. Let's skip it. Instead, 
I'll jump ahead several years to the point where I understood something, at least something more, about what I wanted to do. And this gets back to what I was talking about earlier, about the kind of stories you choose to write. All I knew when I began my real work was that I wanted to write about real things, real life, ostensibly. You know, mundane stuff. What the great books are supposedly all about. An attempt to transmit the experience of being alive. How to do that? I had barely a clue. Autobiography seemed the most direct form, and I tried that. Later, I found fiction more freeing. The funny thing is, though, at that early point, I figured I would write many types of stories about real life. Perhaps something journalistic, perhaps a love story, a coming of age, I don't know. It all seemed possible enough, but none of it ever happened. Why? Mostly because you find yourself following a thread. One story follows another, and as time goes by, you discover the stories are much the same, if not exactly the same. Variations on a theme. It turns out you have something you want to say, and you seem to want to keep saying it over and over again. You don't plan it that way, but before you know it, there is a kind of story that you are known for except you don't remember picking it. I think this is a common experience among writers. You don't write to reveal yourself to the reader. It's the other way around. Doing the work shows you just who you are to yourself. There is a line in the film Metropolitan where the character Charlie says, quote, Of course there is a God. We all basically know there is. When you think to yourself, and most of our waking life is taken up thinking to ourselves, you must have that feeling that your thoughts aren't entirely wasted, that in some sense they are being heard. End quote. I recall when I first saw the film, this line jumped out at me. Not because I believe in a God who is listening to my thoughts but because it feels like there is a God who is listening to my thoughts. The whole thing struck me as simply feeling correct. Again, not because I believe in any sort of genuine God out there, but because of the eerie quality that being alive possesses, a quality that certainly doesn't feel mundane. It's dreamlike and odd And it's hard to believe that these inner and outer worlds we experience are anything but otherworldly. Surely this weird experience of being alive has to seep into anything you write. Well, anything I write. So every story of mine has a moment like that, a moment of unseeing. And I suspect any time I write about the unreality of existence... I'm talking in some way about an afterlife, about how there can't possibly be one, and about how I can't seem to envision anything else but one. So, sitting at the drawing table, I often ask myself, what is all this writing and drawing about anyway? It's a funny way to spend your life. Why do we do it? Why so much of it, too? Busy work, of course. Something to fill all the time. But that can't be the main reason. I suspect it's another form of talking to ourselves. But not just ourselves. We hope someone is listening. And to paraphrase Charlie, that it is not entirely wasted. I'd like to think it isn't. I do. I do believe that. Somewhere on the prairies, at the edge of a little town, there is a closed-up drive-in theater. Closed 10 years. (laughs) 
Next to that drive-in, you'll find a rusted out kitty carousel that no child has touched since 1973. And on the shores of Lake Huron, there is a cottage. And in that cottage, there is a back room. And in that back room, there is an old cardboard box filled with road maps, insurance folders, appliance pamphlets, mimeographed recipes, and black and white snapshots. A box that has remained unopened in 35 years. Further on, down a gravel road near Algonquin, stands the nailed up information booth of an out of business tourist camp. Inside, under its main counter, is a dusty book open to page 126. This is where it has sat since the door closed for good, since it was absent-mindedly left behind, half read. In these places, and others like them, time is standing still. That was fascinating. Seth, thank you so, so very much. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people have some questions for you. And like I said earlier, if, if people could put your questions in the chat, we will, we will take a look at them and uh, try to manage so that everybody's question get it, gets answered. Can we applaud wildly? Let's just do this and pretend we're applauding wildly. I think that's a marvelous idea, Brenda. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was applauding wildly, certainly. A lot of that reminded me of my own growing up. You and I are of a similar vintage, Seth. And I could relate to much of what you were saying, certainly, and the things that you were talking about in terms of, of memory and the reliability or the not so much reliability of memory, but the way that it comes up in your work. And I really do appreciate that. Uh, someone, Maria Fitzgerald, has posted a question. What materials and technology do you use to make your comics? Well, as I was talking about earlier uh, in the talk, too, is that uh, comics, what's great about them, at least uh, for cartoonists of my generation, is they are a very low tech medium. Um, I literally, um, still draw comics the way I drew them 40 years ago, which is, uh, you know, paper and um, pencils and ink. Um, I mostly work with a brush. Um, the, the, the funny thing about comics is, and I'll try to keep this short, not to make it too technical or boring, but comics are like, have always been determined by how they were reproduced because they're a mass medium. So the, co the cartoonists of the 19th century all worked in like steel engravings and wood blocks. And then once they could take photographs of, of drawings, they had to work with India ink because it had to be a really bold drawing so that it could properly reproduce. And that led to a whole culture of artists working with brushes and the brush became sort of the ultimate tool for the cartoonist of the 20th century. So for myself, that was the real thing. I had to learn to properly use a brush to, and there's a real, it's an art form in itself, a kind of calligraphy. But now it's very different. Cartoonists now, their work is predicated by the computer and its technology. And I know lots of young cartoonists now who've never drawn paper at all. It's all entirely done with tablets and with the programs. And a lot of it looks like it's drawn. And I'm pretty amazed myself. But for myself, I still stick to the old, old methods. I work with, you know, I have, I work, of course, with computer technicians who turn my drawings into proper files. But for me, just knowing how to scan an image is like as much skill as I've got with the computer. So is there another question? There is, there's a question, Seth. The other question is how old were you before you first published uh, your, how old were you before you first uh, had your first publication? That's a question from Andrew. Yeah, well, um, I started a bit late. I think my first published work was probably in my early twenties. Um, back then, I came out of art school, and um, I kind of lost the thread for a couple of years. Um, in fact, I talked about that a bit at the end of the essay, but you didn't hear that, so I will tell you now. 
in the last couple of years um, after art school, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I did end up coming back to cartooning. And so the first work I got published was I started to draw a comic book for another a publisher that someone else wrote, and it was called Mr. X. And this was back in the early 80s. And um, I'm really grateful that um, the first work I did was something I didn't draw, because it took me a lot of years, like several years to figure out how to even tell a comic story properly. And uh, I just wasn't mature enough at that point to be writing anything worthwhile. And I'm really grateful that when I look back on those first published works, um, I'm very critical of the drawing. They look terrible to me, but I'm, I'm more happy that I don't, none of the ideas are mine. So I don't have to look back and be embarrassed that I was stupid as well as not being able to draw. So the, the good thing is I had a, an apprenticeship period to really learn, and I do think that's valuable. I do kind of feel sorry for young artists now because they have so much access to getting their work out there. I can only imagine if I'd had everything I'd drawn since I was like 17 to 30 still online, I would be mortified. Seth, uh, Sandra is asking, can you talk a bit more about what it means um, and what is what, what's been involved in unlearning superhero comic conventions? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think a lot of people just think like you look at how the language works and it's essentially cinematic that, you know, one thing follows another thing. And to a big degree, that is how comics, uh, superhero comic books work. They're, I think, well, to digress briefly, if you go back to the turn of the 19th century, 19, the, to the 1900s in the early 20th century, comics weren't like films. They were probably more like a theater show. Every panel was like the figure in exactly the same size as if they were standing on a little stage. You still see this sometimes in the newspaper comics where they don't bother to zoom in on for a close up or show an establishing shot. These are all film terms. And certainly the comics really changed around sometime in the 1940s when uh, cartoonists started to really pay attention to movies. So when I came along as a kid and was reading the comics I grew up with, they were essentially based on that kind of storytelling, which is you follow the characters around as if you're a camera, you go from close ups to long shots to medium shots, above shots, you know, all this sort of stuff. And they were mostly adventure stories. So it is based on like the peak action. In fact, I remember reading this uh, book called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way back when I was a teenager. And they basically showed you how to draw a picture where every single panel was at the most extreme moment of action. So, of course, when I started drawing comics of my own uh, and I wanted to tell subtler stories, you suddenly realized how difficult it was to tell a story where you were trying to do the exact opposite of that, which was to get away from that extreme moment of action. You don't want, if you're drinking a cup of coffee, to be at some sort of super dramatic pose with a cup. You want to like, you want to lower the, the level of intensity in every drawing. And it takes a long time to unlearn that. I mean, I remember about 15 or 20 years ago, I was talking to the cartoonist Chris Ware, uh, who um, has been uh, very influential in my thinking. And I remember he told me once that in a moment of extreme emotion, he doesn't like to draw the main character's face. And I thought, how strange, because that's usually the moment when you pull in on the face. And of course, he said, um, he said, there's something kind of vulgar about getting in so close on that kind of emotion. That was a real good lesson for me to think about, because it's true. It's like that is the moment when you probably want to turn away to look at something else in the panel. That might be where you focus on something that's not the direct moment of emotion. And I mean, I remember I had a story once I had to draw quite early on where I was actually there was a scene where someone is punched. And that was very difficult for me to draw because all I had to use for like my language was all those superhero comics I'd read. And the last thing I wanted was for it to look like the kind of punch that would be in an adventure story. So bit by bit, these kind of things have had to be unlearned. I've had to learn to think of the page as a design rather than as a series of camera shots. You start thinking about how the panels relate to each other and how to move time properly, how to slow things down how to seriously look at what effect you're creating with these graphic images, rather than trying to replicate what you would do if you were following around with a movie camera. So it's been a long process and it's a continuing process. <laughs> 
Thanks, Seth. Trevor is asking a question about art school experience, um, which is sort of where we lost that that um, that one bit of your 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 lecture. Um, benefits of formal training and challenges. Well, it's funny. I do think it's valuable to go to art school. I'm not sure I would have said that if you'd asked me that when I just come out of art school. Um, but at this point, I'm. I'm an advocate for it for a variety of reasons. Um, what I didn't realize then was just how important it was for me to be at school and to broaden my horizons. I went into art school purely intending to be a cartoonist at a time too when art schools were not very um, welcoming of that kind of thinking. Back in like 1980, even a place like OCA was still very affected by the lingering kind of effects of um, of um, abstract expressionism and, and uh, minimalism. So those kind of more um, intellectual pursuits were not really open to people who showed up who wanted to draw comic books. That was really considered like stuff for the gumshoers of the world. And um, my teachers, I would say they were kind, but nobody was encouraging me to do that. Um, what I learned though was from the other students was really valuable to see so many other people who were arriving with very different intentions and those years I was at art school, I think the, more than even what I learned from the teachers, what I learned from the other students was super valuable. I was very young in my thinking. I knew very little about real art in quotes. And um, it was really important to kind of like have my horizons broadened by people my own age, to be discovering film, literature, you know, fine art, uh, avant-garde art, all at the same time. That was kind of a process of helping me unlearn the comics too. And of course, the important thing was suddenly, like, I found that there was a more sophisticated world of, of how to do things, which was a lot came from the teachers to learn different um, techniques, mediums, uh, disciplines, that's the word I'm looking for. And uh, I couldn't have learned that on my own. I mean, I think when I first came out of art school, I said to myself, like, well, that was a waste of time. And I could just learn to be a cartoonist on my own. I don't think that's necessarily true. I do think you can, of course, but I think for me, it was a really valuable place to spend time while I figured out, you know, what I, why I even wanted to be an artist. I mean, what was it about? I think when I went in, it was just I wanted to replicate the exact kind of um, comics or any kind of entertainment that I already enjoy, just to regurgitate more of the same stuff. It took me a while to recognize I might have something of my own to say. Seth, there's so many wonderful questions here. I'm going to put two of them together because they, okay. they, ha they have some similarities. So first, Cheryl's asking about, they're both about buildings and okay. um, the sort of built world in your work. So Cheryl's asking, can you speak about the significance of buildings in telling your stories? And a kind of companion question from Maria, did you build all the building models shown in your slides? Well, first of all, yes, I did build all those building models. That was part of a sort of a side project that developed kind of organically on its own when I was working out a plan for a graphic novel about 20 years ago, I started, I, I started to invent an imaginary town called Dominion and I needed to make up a history for it. And I started to um, sort of build it from the ground up in my mind by making up a bunch of buildings. And that turned into a long-term project on its own that I worked on for about 20 years. Now I'm still building up that city in, in, um, in notebooks, making up the history of this place. But the buildings themselves, I stopped making them at 100 buildings. And that was a few years ago. So I've stopped making those. But as to the importance of the built environment, it's funny. It's always hard to explain why certain, what certain aspects of your work are about. Because a lot of the times they develop on their own without you making conscious choices. It's not like I sat down at some point and said, I'm going to start focusing on, on architecture or landscape um, in my work. I think that developed as a natural outgrowth of kind of what I was talking about earlier, the idea of steering away from a face in the moment of, of the most emotion. It became a part of my method of telling a story was that it was important to have, um, rather than always be looking at what the characters were doing to move around the environment they were in. If you wanna slow comics really down, one of the things you, like the narrative down, you, you start to realize is what are you drawing? when things are really slowed down. You don't wanna have a hundred pages of a, a character in the same position with the same cup of coffee in front of them while he muses about things. And so you start to develop strategies 
to keep the images interesting on the page. And much of that started out in my work was it, uh, that I would start to show the landscape around the character, the room, the objects in it, or the street. A lot of it was really urban at first. And I think I started to recognize that like there is just so much um, evocative power in uh, certainly in the man-made environment. Um, I started to draw buildings more and more. And the fact that so much of my work is about the past, buildings are such a clear indication of that sort of ghost world of the past that's still lingering. I mean, what more in our environment do you see that evokes the past than old buildings? It's the number one thing. And the fact that they, they take on the qualities of age and time and memory in the fact that they, they slowly decay, they change, they get built around. They become kind of, sometimes you'll see buildings that are inherently sad because they've been like kind of like ruined or buildings that are perfectly preserved that have a sort of unreal quality. There's a ton of evocative uh, elements to buildings and to the environment itself that I just think it's, it's um, a really valuable tool in telling a story. And beyond that, I just find that they're like, they're probably the thing that I, I most like to draw. I've become increasingly interested in description and in comics, the writing of description often is the drawing. They're inseparable. You, you certainly, you can have a panel where you're saying like, um, there was an old building on the hill, but it makes a lot more sense to just draw these things and let them uh, go in through another channel when the person is reading. Um, the other element about um, buildings that's so important to me is that, um, they're, they're like a representation of, that comes out of, of who you are without you even planning it in a way. Like when I moved away from Toronto and started living in Guelph, at some point, someone said to me at one point, why do you always draw the countryside? And then I realized, oh, I am always drawing the countryside. But I didn't realize, I'd always been drawing urban scenes before that. Your environment creeps out through your work, whether you want it to or not. And I think that my work now seems to be much more filled with scenes of like rolling hills and, and silos and electrical towers than it is of skyscrapers. And Glenn is asking um, about, so many of your most admired colleagues are well known, Chris Ware, Charles Schultz, R. Crumb, who in your opinion is the most interesting, underrated or relatively unknown comic artist? That's always a tough one. Um, I mean, my easy answer would be a cartoonist by the name of Chris Reynolds, because of the fact that I did a book, I collected a book of his work two or three years ago, and he was a cartoonist from the 1980s from Britain, who, uh, um, who I'd always been very, very attracted to his work. And I did a book uh, with um, the New York Times uh, comics publishing called uh, More, The New World. Uh, stories from Mauritania, um, and um, I'm a big fan of his work. And actually, there's a, a Canadian connection, another artist I would list. There's a man by the name of Martin Von James. He's dead now, but he produced a great deal of work with the Coach House Press back in the early 70s. And um, I'm putting out a book of his, uh, some of his stuff also from the same uh, New York Times publisher uh, coming out uh, next year, and it's called, um, it's a collection of two of his books called The Projector and Elephant, and it's like a kind of a flip book with one of these on each side. Um, I suppose to some degree these artists are, um, have become kind of obscure, although uh, certainly Chris Reynolds was known in his time, but his work has kind of declined in, in people knowing them, and um, and Martin Von James would have been well known in Toronto, certainly, and in Canada back in those days as a very avant-garde artist. In fact, he might be the very first cartoonist to have ever had a solo show at the Art Gallery of Ontario back in the early 70s. But, you know, time erases some of these things. The other artist I would bring up is a, man, a young man by the name of John McNaught, who's also from, uh, from England and um, a very exciting young cartoonist. Um, I'm just uh, an enormous fan of what he does. He does very quiet comics, very little writing in them, often a lot about memory, beautiful. I think he works exclusively in like a silkscreen kind of uh, format, which is unusual, almost all color and no line. Um, you can find his work, I think, through, um, what's the name of his publisher? Oh, I've forgotten. 
but his name is John McNaught, J-O-N. I needed to unmute myself. I have a question for you. Okay. If we, ha if we have caught up, I don't want to cut anybody off. I want everybody to have a chance, but I, I listened to the interview that you gave the other day on the CBC with Alan Neal, which was really interesting. And that sort of primed the pump for me to be thinking about the things that, that you've now shared with us tonight. And so I'm struck by how the mundane is all through your work. And suddenly the mundane is beautiful. How do you do that? And if you, if you see it that way, is there a way that we can all become better at seeing the beauty in the mundane the way you dis the way that you demonstrate it in your work? Did you have to teach yourself that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I certainly tried to teach myself that in how to tell a story and the idea of how to slow down and focus on mm -hmm. things. And that has been important. I mean, I think like, like everyone, we all have a very like a profound connection to um, the things in our life. I mean, people, people talk about it all the time. I mean, so much of what I see online is people um, photographing things they love, talking about places they love. It's like, it's a natural human impulse to focus on these details of our lives. I think one of the things though, is that we're kind of taught that the, the little details of our lives are boring and that other people aren't interested in them and we shouldn't uh, bore people with them. But I do think that we instinctually know that that's not true because we're the things that interest us are deeply our very day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, it's the stuff you're gonna remember. I mean, when we talk about memory, that's what's so odd about memory is that so much of it isn't the important stuff. Uh, we don't get to choose what we remember and a great deal of what makes up like who we are are these very mundane experiences and yet these experiences have real profound qualities to us i think about this stuff a lot but part of it helps is that i sit around in a room by myself like 10 hours a day and that experience of being alone and a lot of the time what i'm doing is what i call busy work where you're you know you're inking things that you've already drawn you're erasing things it's all very it's laborious work it gives you a lot of time for the mind to wander and in that process of wander, I think a lot about memory and I think a lot about how to infuse these kind of qualities into the stories. I want this stuff to be, it's tricky. I want, think, I want to capture that um, deep uh, feeling that we have for emotional feeling we have for places and events and memories, but I don't want it to be too sappy. And it is a very thin line between like um, sentiment and sentimentality. And I find that it's it's tricky. I'm never really too sure which side of the line I'm on um, because it's it's very easy to just, I mean, we've all seen things where you turn away from it because it's too sentimental, but then there's the other side where you get to the sweet spot where people, you can actually feel, you know, something has genuinely be been touched about that. Um, that's one of the reasons why I mentioned like going through your parents' things after they're dead. I mean, there's a tremendous power to those objects that they have. Um, you don't even have to have ever seen them before. When I went through my father's things after he died, I was, my heart was broken by how little he had. First of all, compared to someone like me who's a collector, I have thousands of things and I pity the people who go through what my stuff after I'm dead. He had such a tiny amount of stuff and also the stuff itself, much of it I'd never even seen before, papers he chose to keep, um, it built, it, you know, that's a story of a life right there. You don't even need to write a story. You just put those objects, like a hundred objects on a series of pages and there's a story. And, you know, that's got human emotion like built right into it. Thanks very much. I, yeah, I really do appreciate that. We have one last question and I think we'll wrap up after that and give you a little bit of a break. This has been so interesting, but Sandra is asking, uh, can you talk about the role of color in your work? How did you come to be working in a monochromatic palette? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the funny thing is when I started out, um, there was like the publishing industry was quite different for comics. For one thing, um, there, nobody was using computers at all. 
and much and the printing technology was more expensive than it is now. So when I first started, um, there was um, kind of a, uh, a movement or whatever you call it, a, a, a um, phenomenon that occurred where people started to publish their own comic books or small publishers appeared. And the comic books were published exclusively in black and white. It was called the black and white explosion. And the reason that uh, they published in black and white is it was cheap. So when I first started, it was just black and white, but I already developed a certain style that uh, needed a bit of like some kind of tone on it. My line work was too bare to just publish in black and white. So I would use a gray tone. We could afford that. But eventually, at some point, the printing started to come down and cost a little bit. And my publisher, Chris Oliveros, at Drawn and Quarterly, said to me sometime in the early 90s, he said, you can have one color. So I was like, oh, I can have one color. So I thought, well, what color will I pick? And the color I picked was blue. Now, I picked blue because I don't think I really, I, you know, I don't even think I gave it a great deal of thought. I think I, I, there was a, I was looking through some books, and I saw some, a nice monochrome painting that had it was primarily blue and so I went with blue but blue of course turned out to be the right color for me as I've used it over the years it's kind of become my signature color and I think you know blue is melancholy we got the blues but it was also blue seems the perfect tone for for memory somehow I suppose sepia might have been a good tone as well but that seems a little more trite but um blue just seemed right and as I, I, I you know I used blue for about I don't know, 10 or 15 years before I had an opportunity to start using more colors. The point I'm at now, you could literally, anyone starting in comics can have as many colors as they want. That doesn't really exist anymore. And you'll see young cartoonists who are starting out, even when they're publishing, like self-publishing mini comics, like printed uh, comics, they're quite colorful. There's a lot of options available for what you can do. But I just got used to working in monochrome and eventually I realized how uh, potent it is as a graphic design uh, device. You can really focus people's eyes when you're telling a story, when you're just using one or two colors. Um, back in the old days in comics, when they had like full, full color, the mainstream comics, they used to have a term for when you use too many colors and it was called a pizza page. And that would be that, you know, it was so busy that you couldn't even like look at it and have the eye directed. So. So for myself, I've just, I would say it's, it was mostly pragmatic how I ended up with one color, but now it's an aesthetic. I, you know, if I draw in my sketchbook, I tend to work in one color. Sometimes I do full colors, but I like monochrome. I think it's very suiting to what I do. And I think you're quite right. And I noticed you're wearing a blue jacket tonight. So, you know, we're, you're, you're definitely, you know, bearing out your own theory there. And uh, I would just point out that we also talk about blue is such an interesting color because we also talk about blue skying. You know, I'm just going to blue sky for a while, which yeah. is a lot of what we do with your work. You take us to places where we can blue sky and just let our thoughts go and see what happens. Uh, and a number of people have commented that your work is fabulous, that they, they love it, they want to see more. And I would agree with all of them. And I'm so very grateful that we could make this happen tonight. I'm so sorry about that glitch. And if we can do something about fixing that before the, the recording is made available, we will do the very best we can around that. Um, I'm not the tech person, so don't ask me how that works because I have no clue. But if it's possible, I know that these folks will be able to do it. And I just want to thank you so, so much for being willing to go on this adventure with us. It has been a real treat. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and now all of the people are throwing in their, their thank yous all through the chat. So you will be getting lots of, of messages to thank you for this. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, such it's such a lovely thing to be able to share something like this. We do one of these every year. And now that we know that we can do it if we have to, not in person, then maybe we've just opened up a whole other way of being and you just never know. So please stay tuned for what will happen next year. One never knows. There's always an adventure around the corner. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank <laughs> you.